What is going on world? What's up YouTube? It's Zero here. Today I'm bringing you guys a brand new episode of the 8 Below Show. Welcome everyone to 8 Below. Thanks for being here guys to the best gaming related show here on YouTube. And I'm super excited about our episode here today. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, so let's get into it. I'm feeling nostalgic right now. Do you guys remember a game series called Castlevania? It was a gaming series, guys, that came out all the way back in 1986, and it's had a number of releases since its first, of course, its first initial release. And at this point, it's a big question mark as to what the future of this series might hold. So let's talk about Castlevania and what happened to the franchise. Guys, as I said, in 1986 is when Castlevania first started. Obviously, I wasn't even alive back then. But over the course of time, we're talking a span of, you know, from, you know, 1986 all the way to 2014, guys, is when we got our last release. I mean, there was a number of releases here that ended up happening so consistently. I mean, you're talking 86, 87, 88, 89 each year, you were having either expansions or you were having new games. Of course, there was a break in 90, then you had another game in 91. Uh, and then, of course, you had, you know, 92 was off. You had 93 to 95, then you, another in 97. Now, some of these guys are obviously expansions and, and you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, continuations of the franchise. But that being said, when you look at the consistency here, I mean... There was a game every single year, or at least an expansion, from 2005 to 2010. Then you had a couple of years off until 2013, Castlevania Lords of Shadow, Mirror of Fate, uh, came out in 2013. And then our very last uh, edition of the franchise was back in 2014, Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2. Well, what I wanted to talk about, guys, was an article that came out from Jordan uh, Barnowski from SVG about why Konami won't release another console, Castlevania. So the Castlevania series is one of the classes of gaming. The original game first appeared in 1986, and the Belmont clan has been hunting bloodsuckers ever since. All told, there have been dozens of Castlevania titles across nearly every imaginable platform. The series has been included on both the NES Classic and SNES Classic, appearing alongside Nintendo's own historic characters and worlds. It's a game series that has endured its ups and downs and has withstood the test of time, and it always seems like a solid choice for a classic revival. However, fans' request to Konami have sw fallen on mostly deaf ears. It seems unlikely that a big-budget console Castlevania will be headed down the pipe in the foreseeable future for a number of reasons. Never say never, but we wouldn't hold our breath for a new entry in this series anytime soon. So, let's get the obvious out of the way. When most fans clamor for a new Castlevania title, they want a new Symphony of the Night. The 1997 PlayStation title helped to redefine the direction of the series and even co-established the name of the genre, Metroidvania, along with Nintendo's Metroid franchise. Giant Bomb writes that even though games in the 2D side scrolling action title with exploration elements existed long before 1997, Symphony of the Night is the title that defined the genre as the word Metroidvania became common uh, nomenclature not long after its release. So look, before we go any farther, guys, I think something that's really important to, to mention is that you can never say never to something like Castlevania. I mean, this is a franchise that has been going on for a very long time, so I would never put it past Konami. Now, is, it, is Konami working on a number of other projects? Yeah, probably. There's been rumor of a new Silent Hills coming out. There's been a lot of different talks of different titles around Konami. But that doesn't mean that they would never come back to Castlevania. Obviously, they were doing something right with a series that would, was kind of testing time, essentially, because, I mean, obviously this franchise has been going on for so long, so why wouldn't they continue the series at some point or another? Now, after Symphony of the Night, the Castlevania series was riding high. The new technology available on the PlayStation and Nintendo 64 meant that the next entry in the series would be even bigger and better, right? Not so fast. The first official Castlevania title after Symphony of the Night was Castlevania Legends. It came out on the original Game Boy and is the lowest rated in the series. After that, the maligned 
Nintendo 64 titles were released, the first received some average ratings, but the second of those titles, Legacy of Darkness, received a critical shellacking upon release. Castlevania was not continuing a hot street in the late 90s. So look, um, I think part of this kind of gets me to the first real thing, I think, what happened to Castlevania was there was a lot of games, right? But a lot of those ended up being not as good as people were thinking or uh, were hoping for, obviously. I mean, think, I, I think what ended up happening was there were just too many bad titles in Castlevania, even with the reboots and all of those different things. It seemed that no matter what Konami was doing, it still was getting bad reception overall. It just didn't have that same, that that, that real same feeling that people loved about Castlevania in the past. With the fits and starts that the Castlevania series was going through, Konami decided it was time for a change. The longtime lead of the series and brains behind Symphony of the Night, Koj Igarshi, was shifted to another part of the company, and the reins were handed over to directive, different creative directors. This new branch of Castlevania series was called Lords of Shadow, and it was good. However, like we've already seen with Castlevania, that success would not last. The first Lords of Shadow game was met with extremely positive reviews. It was in Symphony of the Night, but it was a good new direction for the series. The sequel, Mirror of Fate, slipped a bit, and the true follow-up, Lords of Shadow 2, just could not live up to the lofty perception of Castlevania. True fans wanted a side-scrolling sequel worthy of Symphony of the Night, but Konami was going through too much turmoil to make that happen. And that was kind of step number two of what happened to Castlevania, guys. Number one was obviously some bad games that came out. Even when a good game came out, Konami was going through some stuff at this time as well, just problems internally with the, you know, of course, with the developer. Now, Kotaku writes that about the time the first Lords of Shadow game came out, something strange was happening at Konami. A mobile title called Dragon Collection was making a tremendous return on the relatively small development cost, and big budget titles were starting to look less appealing to the people in charge. The corporate culture and some of the bigger branches of the studio began to suffer as a result. The report from Nikkei from uh, that Kotaku reference indicates some awful working conditions. Cameras were installed not for security reasons, but to monitor employee movement. Staff that were deemed no longer viable were reassigned as security guards or manual laborers rather than being laid off. Members of the staff that expressed support for an employee who was leaving the company were shuffled into less desirable uh, positions. So, obviously, uh, Konami had uh, go, gone through a lot of bad things, guys. We're about to get to some of the other things that they did, that being like uh, parting ways or kind of having disagreements with some of their most beloved creators, that being Hideo Kojima. So unless you were completely outside of video game culture in 2015, you probably heard about the saga between Konami and Hideo Kojima. The maestro of the critically acclaimed Metal Gear Solid series, Kojima fell out hard and fast with his own company. The studio removed its name from Metal Gear Solid 5 and makes practically no mention of him creating the game. Polygon writes, writes that Konami restricted internet and communication a as access for senior members of Kojima's team, and it wasn't long before he was out of the company working on a new IP. So, obviously, guys, I think part of the unfortunate quote-unquote, end of Castlevania happened in a time where Konami just had a lot of problems going on. Internally, as, as, as a team, they just had so many issues going on. Uh, whether you're talking work conditions, whether you're talking about having disagreements with some of your best creators and the best minds in all of gaming as a whole, Hideo Kojima, he's, I mean, this guy could become one of the greatest, you know, game developers all time and creative directors out there. So, when you have someone like that, you don't have disagreements. Now, it looks good that Konami and Hideo are coming back together, allegedly, to work on Silent Hills. But that leads me to the next thing is, maybe Konami just doesn't have Castlevania even in in the, the background at this point. Not even a thought, really. They're looking straight ahead to how can they can repair their image in one way, shape, or form. So, look, the other thing... Uh, that probably went wrong is, is Konami's decision to move away from big budget console games seems to be in part due to the growth of the mobile game market. 
Part of it dates back to the 2010 release of Dragon Collection, but small budget mobile games raking in massive amounts of money has to be an enticing prospect for any gaming company. That siren song has not gone unheard in the hallowed halls of Castlevania. If you are desperate for anything related to the series, there's a brand new title coming soon to iOS in Japan at some point. Castlevania Grimmer, Grimmer of Souls is a 2D side-scoring Castlevania title featuring both fourth player co-op and competitive play. The closed beta occurred in early 2018, but it was also exclusive to Japan. Konami has been fairly tight-lipped about Grimmer of Souls since then, but they have been abdomen that it is an iOS exclusive and not headed to consoles. So look, guys, and we see this so much uh, in many different games, right? In gaming, uh, and just in general, a lot of big developers and publishers are looking at console, uh, you know, uh, console games versus that of you know, mobile games, and Castlevania might just be suffering the same fate as Command and Conquer, as this, as Diablo, even though Diablo is obviously getting in Diablo 4, but just a lot of these big games and, and, and really AAA titles, technically speaking, out there are getting mobile games, not saying it's a bad thing, because you can, at least it's a way you can continue connecting with the franchise, but at the same time, People want to be able to, to play like a, a console game or a, a PC game, have true additions to the franchise. Having it on your mobile phone or, uh, you know, something of that nature is great because it kind of, you know, it can pass some time when you're, when you're bored at home or something. But when you actually want to play a game, a lot of times you want to sit down and actually play a game on the console or on PC. And so I think, guys, that was step three, is really Konami moving in this direction of playing on your mobile device versus console is definitely the direction they're going in moving forward with Castlevania. And who knows how far that's going to go because with Command & Conquer Rivals, didn't really go so well for that franchise. And who knows what the future looks like with Command & Conquer moving forward, even though they did announce a remastered version of those games. But let me know what you guys think about Castlevania. Would you guys want there to be a continuation of this franchise? Let me know in the comment section below. Because as a community, guys, if you want this game made and you're a huge fan of Castlevania, you have to voice your opinion and you have to really start a movement around it to try to get Konami's attention as to, hey, we want this game, we want a continuation of these games, a storied franchise, that we want it to continue on consoles and on PC, and uh, even on, of course, like even on mobile devices, whatever it might be, continuations are something that we have to voice to the developers. But like I said, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And for more Castlevania content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. Quake is a franchise, guys, that I think is one of the greatest first-person shooters of all time. And I don't know if there's any debate about it. This is a franchise, guys, that is really tested, you know, time in a in a way in which we have seen a franchise go that started in 1996 and has gone through some very, you know, some turmoil, has gone through some ups and downs, of course, like any huge franchise, but I think that there's a real need and a real want for a continuation of this franchise. So let's talk about Quake and, and where is Quake 5 at this point. So guys, like I said, Quake Star 1996, and you had a number of different mission packs that came out following the original Quake game, which uh, to this day, guys, uh, is is one of my just favorite uh, first per you know first person shooter games ever. I thought it was absolutely incredible. You had Quake 2 in 1997, so one year later had more mission packs, and then you had Quake 3 Arena come out two years after that in '99, had one. Uh, Team Arena come out, and then Quake 4 came out in 2005, so a number of years later it came out, and then you had Enemy Territory Quake Wars in 2007, Quake Live in 2010, and then Quake Champions eight years later in 2018, and since Quake Champions, we haven't gotten anything else, Quake Champions is specifically a multiplayer experience, no story mode, nothing of that nature, and I think, guys, that here's the thing. Quake, I believe, is is one of those games that kind of reminds me of, of what could be, you know, not necessarily like Doom, but similar to that. I mean, Bethesda, as well as, you know, ID Software, 
are the ones who are pretty much who have kind of helmed this franchise. Now, obviously, Bethesda kind of took over in 2010. This went through a lot of a lot of hands, guys. It went through GT Interactive when it first came out, then to Activision Electronic Arts, Square Electronic Arts, to Bethesda Softworks. Um, and so, look, here's the thing. I believe that what Quake is is at this point is a game that you know it's not necessarily a distant memory because it came out in 2018 we had quake champions but only only for you know just a multiplayer experience no story mode nothing of that uh, of that sorts but i found a really neat article it came out a little while ago but i think it's still relevant to this day from Omri Petit of PC Gamer, it's what Quake 5 can learn from Doom, and what they're talking about is Doom 2016. Doom and Quake are the twin gods of uh, first-person shooter gaming. Their fates are inextricably bonded. With Doom's recent triumphant return, it's likely we'll soon catch wind of a new Quake. The time is right, too. It's been nearly 11 years since Quake 4 released, and revisits to a more traditional run-and-gun FPS design is a rising vote. Whether it'll be called Quake, Quake 5, or Pennsylvania Quaker's Revenge, ID's younger sibling can draw from Doom's strengths and shortcomings to rightfully stand among the pantheon of successful reboots. So look guys, obviously Doom Eternals come out, and this is being argued as one of the greatest first person shooters of all time, uh, which is Pretty, I mean, that's a big statement, guys. People love Doom Eternal. I've played it for a little bit, and I really enjoyed the game as well. But could a Quake 5... I, I mean, in my personal opinion, guys, Bethesda has made a lot of mistakes with some of their franchises they own. And, I, you know, really Fallout being the, the main one at this point, at least one bad game, right? But more so than that... I think that it's important that Bethesda, they take and really cherish the titles that are doing, you know, very well for them. Doom being one of them, and Quake could be the other one. Classic Doom is still being modded over two decades since its release, and its thriving, thriving WAD community remains a testament to the creativity, creativity of its badass and bizarre player content. Even one of its original creators has added to its legacy. The same can't be said about Doom Snap Map, a tool set intended for players to piece together and share custom levels in a seamless process. Its layout curbs complexity for approachability, and while ease of use for modding is a welcome concept on the PC, its limitations sorely underscore the lack of true mod support. So, ID wisely chose to avoid saddling Doom Guy with needless characterization. His sole concern is the exquisite art of separating demons from their organs. It's all he needs to propel the plot, and no grim, grim dark space marine trope can compare in effectiveness. Quake broadly follows suit. You're a lone warrior pitted against armies of ugly monsters, combat rules supreme in both universes, and Doom's exposition was smartly presented as a secondary diversion instead of an unavoidable necessity. Optional data logs and brief first-person sequences of Doom Guy or Doom Slayer punching some computer monitor is the best method for conveying as little or as much story as the player wants. So what I think they're getting at here is, look, make a really, you know, make a story mode, right? Quake Champions, it's a multiplayer experience. It's fun. People enjoy it. But look, get back to the core of Quake. Make this a great, uh, you know, multiplayer experience, but also a campaign. Make it like a, a great co-op experience. Make it a great eSport again. And that's why I think so many people want at this point. They want there to be a full package here. Kind of like what you're getting with Doom Eternal. You're getting like this full package deal. I mean, not only is it a great, you know, a campaign, you got yourself, of course, a very unique battle mode, that being the multiplayer. So, just different ways that you can connect with the franchise, I think, is what we're looking for in a Quake 5. So a jaunt into the demonic home realm of Eternal Torment is an inevitable checkmark on Doom Guy's itinerary. The point of departure is a portal swirling in the center of the Mars UAC facility. The compound sports a straightforward rendition of corporate lab disaster, interior decorating, chrome paneling, beeping sign stuff, a neutral voiced AI calmly recounting horrific casualty rates 
over the PA and the occasional culty candle circle. Doom's depiction of hell is a surprisingly tame translation, a rockier, readier Mars-style exterior with floating boulders and skulls carved everywhere. For a place acting as the planar trophy hall of conquered dimensions, hell is less Dolly and more Dio Albin cover. So, obviously, guys, this is something like that Quake could take from Doom. Uh, because they're they're similar like they're all uh, very different but at the same time they're they're similar in different ways right a lot some of the movement and things of that nature kind of feel similar both doom and quake shaped the very fiber of fps movement their influence is used to this day mouse look sprinting and sustained momentum were all molded by doom's simple controls and quake's 3d evolution doom 2016's emphasis on old school speed was a welcome relief to the sluggishness of Doom 3's more survival horror style and the frenetic combat reflected the importance of staying in motion to survive a constant threat. Quake is no stranger to this concept. It practically heralded the rise of bunny hopping and trick jumping in multiplayer and speed running circles decades ago. And that's so true, guys. I mean, really, Quake was a such an innovative first person shooter. And I think Doom was too, but I think Doom is actually um has grown in so much more popularity since Doom 2016 and now with Doom Eternal, man. I mean, this fan base is starting to absolutely flourish. ID wanted Doom's multiplayer to embody the genre's modern standards, a progressive system, loadouts and so on, but it also didn't want to stray too far off the path beaten by successful games which paradoxically elaborate on Doom's own format over the years. Those contrasts didn't translate into standout material. Sprinkling an area with jump pads and having rockets flying everywhere isn't some sort of magical pedigree for an arena shooter, and locking away weapons behind the progression system didn't gel with the equal footing ethos may, many uh, came to expect from ID. So look, this is Quake 5's moment to shine brightly with the strongly defined multiplayer, it boasts the advantage of utilizing an experienced framework tempered by Doom's easily avoidable inconsistencies and the heritage of Quake 3's competitive heyday. Its weapons and power-ups should evoke the same breathy, uh, breathy reference as the railgun, rocket launcher, and quad damage instead of falling short of character. It should forge he uh, heady memories as strong as a free-for-all night on the longest yard. Should Quake stay strong with its identity, it may emerge once more as the flag bearer for arena gaming. And I got to say, guys, I, I can't disagree with that. I really can't. Um, I think if, if, if Bethesda and ID Swap Software, if they take some of the things that they learned from Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, put those things to the test with Quake, Quake 5, in my opinion, is going to make a massive comeback. Absolutely massive comeback. And if you're a fan of the Quake franchise... I really think that you should be excited because number one is you see the success of Doom. You see what Doom's doing and obviously you want to see that same success for, for Quake and I do as well. I want to see Quake as a massive first person shooter game uh, in this space and I think that it would be, I think it would be great. The arena shooter I really believe could be something special, especially moving into the next generation of consoles. But let me know what you guys think. What do you guys want to see the most in Quake 5? Let me know in the comment section below. And for more Quake 5 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. A game I'm super excited about is Watch Dogs Legion, guys. This is a game that looks absolutely incredible. I mean, it easily looks like the best game in the franchise. Because Watch Dogs, guys, has always been very intriguing to me. It had a lot of those similar types of movement and such as The Division, which is, of course, another Ubisoft game. But there was something about Watch Dogs I thought that seemed like it, it had something to it. There was something there that really could be something special, but I felt like each edition of the game, which, of course, we've had two up to this point, just didn't really meet expectation or didn't really get to where it could have been that being a pretty big franchise. Now, obviously, Watch Dogs is big enough because Ubisoft is making another game, right? So this is going to be the third game in the franchise. But I think that Watch Dogs Legion, it could redefine the franchise in a number of ways. 
that not being just a story mode or like a full fledged out story mode that I think is going to be really well done. I, I just do. I mean, because when I'm looking at it, London seems like an interesting point in time to be to be there and to be able to explore those streets and just really get completely immersed in this world of Watch Dogs Legion. You look at Watch Dogs 2, I believe that was based in Chicago, was it? Which didn't really... Not that Chicago is a boring place, because I I've lo- I love Chicago. I've gone there a number of times, and I think it's a great city. But in a video game, it just wasn't that great of a city to have a video game based in, for one reason or another. That being said, though, Watch Dogs Legion, obviously, I think is taking that next step. It's going to, to London. I think that's going to be something really interesting around the Brexit time. I think that when you look at a number of different angles here... This game could redefine the franchise, not only within the campaign mode, but the multiplayer modes as well. Now, we don't know everything yet about the game. It's not something that they have given us a ton of information on. We've seen gameplay, we've seen trailers and things of that nature. What's really cool though is you can really recruit other people into your group. And that is something that I think might be really interesting Uh, as you're playing. The same thing can be said with like the multiplayer. I'm assuming that you're going to be able to recruit people to your clan or to your group as you go through the multiplayer. And then on top of that, I think they learned that with Watch Dogs 2, there just wasn't, there were some modes that people really liked, but man, at this point, guys, I can't believe how dead the viewership of Watch Dogs 2 and Watch Dogs is like on Twitch and other places, people just don't really watch, you know, people streaming the game. And that's really unfortunate because I think that this is a game that's one step from being the next really big franchise out there. And Watch Dogs Legion, I think, could very well be that if it is, you know, released in a way in which, obviously, it's not going up against a ton of other competition, and it's obviously a game that, I think if they really show us exactly what we're going to be getting with the multiplayer modes, co-op modes, and the campaign, to show that it's different at least from the first two Watch Dogs game, even though it may still have that same, you know, main coat on top of it, it at least has enough differences to keep you coming back to the game. Because I think the most important thing here is having people come back to the franchise the first two Watch Dogs had a full package. It was, you know, they had a multiplayer, they had different ways you could connect with the franchise, but I think the biggest thing with Legion is not only, like, co-op, playing with your friends and really, like, recruiting people into your clan, and we'll see how that, you know, turns out, but it's also that I think the campaign looks great, graphically looks amazing, but on top of that, the multiplayer experience, I think, is what's going to bring people back, depending on all the different modes that they bring out, and I'm really excited about it. I really am. I think this could be, and this is their chance at making Watch Dogs a, a very a main name within gaming. And I really believe that, guys. I think that it, it looks very intriguing. I'm very interested. When the first Watch Dogs came out and Watch Dogs 2 came out, I just wasn't, like, I thought they look good. I'll probably play them at some point. I'll rent them and, and, you know, play them and see what they're all about. And I did exactly that. And they were exactly what I thought they would be. They were, they, they, they were good. They weren't like terrible or anything. They were good games, but I just felt like they didn't reach the full potential that they had. But I think Legion very well might be able to reach that potential and make this go from a game that, that, you know, that has a, a solid community to one that may have a much bigger community uh, at the end of it. So with that being said, though, guys, I want to hear from all of you. What are you most excited about with Watch Dogs Legion? Let me know in the comment section below. And for more Watch Dogs Legion content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. And with that being said, everyone, I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of The Ape Below Show. And if you guys did, leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, stay positive, and as always... I'll talk to you guys all in the next one. Peace.